Amen. Amen. Take your Bibles. Would you please open them to 1 Peter chapter 1 in our verse-by-verse study through the book of 1 and 2 Peter. Uh, We're going to cover one verse tonight and pause to build up to end the chapter in verse 22 where we left off. And the Bible study is entitled, Love One Another Fervently. And you'll understand by the time we end today why we want to focus on this, especially in the time in which we live now. The necessity of love and a fervent, passionate love for one another. Now, Peter, in his life, became a wonderful pastor. He became a wonderful shepherd of God's people. He learned his lessons well. As you read about him throughout the scripture, you see that he didn't always do things right. He didn't always say things right. He made mistakes, small and large, but he learned his lessons well. Both the great faith and great failure, God used them both in his life. And remember, as Peter is writing this letter, he's writing it as a pastor. I believe the heart of a pastor, the heart of a shepherd. It's too bad that we remember Peter too much for his failures. And it's too bad that he becomes the end of a joke more often than not. Because God When he sees the failures and the mishaps and the weaknesses in Peter, God's conclusion, and we can look back now and see, is that I can use a man like that. I can use a man that learns from his mistakes. I can use a woman that although she falls flat on her face, in my strength, she gets up with great faith. And I would have loved to have Peter as my pastor to sit under his teachings and to listen to his true stories to watch him carefully in his leadership, to serve alongside of him. Because as we read his letter and we continue on through the following chapters, we get a sense of his heart and his care and concern. You know, 1 Peter and 2 Peter remind me of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians is probably the most startling letter that gives us the heart of Paul. Like what it was like for Paul to be a pastor and to be like a missionary pastor. Well, Peter, he bears it all in his letter as well. And we hear his heart and his concern and his care for the people of God. The church wasn't a business to him. It wasn't an organization. The church was the body of Christ. The church were the people of Jesus. Everything was about Jesus I mean, if we use today's terminology, I think in Peter's life, everything in his life was to seek to win a person to Jesus, to win their hearts over, to develop them and disciple them in Jesus, and then to send them out. Even as this group was scattered, the audience of this letter is scattered, but Peter reminds them, you're scattered, it's hard, but God has you where he has you for the sake of the gospel. And it may be hard for you, but God is with you. And it may be challenging for you, but God will use you. And you know that's our heart too. We use those same words. Our desire to win, disciple, and sin. And if you get your eyes off of Jesus, then evangelism is not going to matter much to you anymore. Seeing people grow in the things of God won't matter much anymore. And even sending out will not be a high priority. Every moment of every day is a gift from Jesus Christ. Every day in our lives. Every moment, every breath. Our lives aren't just simply to be spent and wasted on ourselves, but invested in the lives of others. Daily reminded of how Jesus lived for people. And he died and rose again the third day for you and for me. The people you might be mad at right now. The people you might be holding a grudge against. The people that hurt you and harmed you. The people that are making decisions over you and for you that you don't agree with. Remember, two things go with us from here into eternity. Just two. The souls of men and the word of God. Eternal. Not gold. Not cars. Not our houses, our trinkets, our toys. Not our accomplishments or our degrees. Not our businesses, our education, our earthly pursuits. Only the souls of men and the word of God go into eternity. The Bible says this, if you want to jot it down, in Psalm 62, verse 10. Do not trust in oppression, nor vainly hope in robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 10. He who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver. 
nor he, nor he who loves abundance with increase. This is also vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. So what profit have the owners except to see them with their eyes? Jesus put it much simpler in a much more pure way, the Son of God. He said this, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. And that's where Pastor Peter is here at the end of chapter 1. He's at a place as he opens up his letter, encouraging a group of struggling people. We have in our minds what we think encouragement sounds like and even feels like. I mean, we even, there's even a book that's been written called The Five Love Languages to help you learn how to communicate with your spouse and with others so that you speak a language that's received by them. But sometimes encouragement from the Lord isn't and doesn't sound like the way you want to hear it. It isn't what you expected. And that's the point where you would then want to resist what God has for you. And what Peter's telling these guys that are struggling, these guys that, I mean, when you think of struggling, we're we're not talking about like getting a flat tire on the side of the road. They have been chased down. They have been run out. And there's a death sentence on their lives within the Roman Empire. Christians are being persecuted at the highest level to date as Peter is writing this letter. And he says, you know, I know you're struggling. I know it's hard. I know it's tough. I know the situation is serious. But isn't it great to know Jesus? That's what he says in chapter 1. Like, isn't it great to remember where you came from? Isn't it such an encouragement? I mean, even today as I was on my way in, Early this morning, I was listening to a Bible study and the brother just said something very simple about what a privilege it is to serve Jesus and to serve him with our best. It was a a very simple but profound statement. And as I was driving, that sparked a thought in my mind as I began to think back on my past. And in my past, before I was born again, in the wicked, sinful life that I lived, I was reminded just on the little trip, it was just basically from Parker Road all the way down Hampton, this thought hit me, all the way here to the office. And I was just thinking, man, when I was in the world, I was all in. I didn't hold anything back. I was, if it was a party, then I was all in. And And if it was a drinking party all night, I was all in. To my own detriment, to the pain of others around me, but like I didn't hold back. I could look back and think, man, when I serve the world, I really serve the world, even if it hurt me, even if it hurt others. And then God brought me to that place of being born again and being delivered from that behavior and that lifestyle, just having my eyes opened and how as a follower of Jesus, God desires me to be just as all in in my life, serving him. And I think many times I am, but sometimes I'm not. Sometimes I get weary and tired as we were seeing in Hebrews. Sometimes I just, it's just enough, I was enough. And it's like, man, Lord, this is just every day, nonstop. The warfare, the difficulties, the challenges he's called me to. And and today I was just reminded, isn't it a great thing just to be born again? that I'm not serving the world anymore. And I might have my issues and I might have to deal with my flesh at times, but it's good that the passion that God, the kind of passionate person that God has made me, that it's good to serve the Lord. And I would even say in tough times, to press in to the tough times that we're in. And that's what he's saying is you kind of look and review in chapter one, he he reminded all the scattered uh, under duress and trial, all the difficulties. He says, isn't it good to be saved and chosen by God? You're born again to a living hope, awaiting an incorruptible inheritance. You're kept by the power of God. Your genuine faith is being purified and revealed. Your love is growing. So what? Gird up the loins of your mind. Be ready for every good work. Rest your hope fully on the grace that's going to be revealed to you. Live holy lives. God values your life more than any earthly possession. That's what we need to hear in the midst of trials. It's worth it to follow Jesus. Even if things get worse, 
Jesus is on the throne and these things cannot be taken away from you. Things can be stolen. Things can be taken away. You can lose your possessions. You could lose your peace. You can lose your comfort. But the reality of your spiritual relationship with God cannot be changed. It's unchanged. It actually becomes more valuable in difficult times is what Peter's saying. And you step back and go, man, I don't know how encouraging that really is. I just want to get out of my trial. I just want to have my way. But the question is this. So Peter's sharing this in chapter one. It's a very challenging, difficult time. And the question is this, even as it's neat how God wove our prayer request together today. The question is this, when somebody comes to you looking for help, looking for counsel, Maybe even asking this loaded question. And let me just say, this is a loaded question. You might want to write it down so you're ready for it. This is a loaded question to you. When somebody comes to you and says, what's your opinion on this matter? What's your opinion? Now, if you're not careful and you're not in a ready state, you might just give your opinion. But that question for your opinion is an open door to give that person God's opinion. Now, of course, if your opinion's been formed biblically, then give it. But when someone comes and asks your opinion on such and such and this and that, that's a loaded question. And if, you're not, if your guard isn't up, you may just start spouting your opinion on a matter when you have gotten an open door to take someone to the very cross of Jesus Christ. Where do we take people when they come to us for counsel? When we hear of their difficult times, do we just settle for giving our wise thoughts and our deep opinions? Or do I pray with them and open the word to them and tell them what the Bible has to say about their current condition? Do I just pat them on the back and send them on their way? Or do I give them the word even if it's difficult to hear Or sometimes, you know, if it's difficult to hear, then it's going to be difficult to deliver at the same time. It's going to be difficult to share the truth in love. But Peter gives us the example. He doesn't share. He doesn't tell them here in chapter one, oh, everything's going to be just fine. It's going to pass. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, oh, don't worry about it. Maybe in a year or two, things will recover and you'll get everything back. No, he says, this is what you need to do. You need to get your eyes on the Lord. Begin to be appreciative once again that you are saved. You're going through this as a saved person, not an unsaved person. You're going through this with hope. You're you're going through this with faith. And the worst thing that can happen to you is the best thing that can happen to you. And that you'll be in the presence of the Lord. And he will fulfill his word. Listen, what people need in times like these is not high-minded opinions or low-minded gossip. They need the word. And there's two things we're going to look in the next two studies. What they need is fervent love and God's faithful word. And today I want to focus on fervent love as we have in verse 22. With all the questions surrounding us today and all the things that, that God is speaking to us. Let me give you, before we move on, let me give you another loaded question uh, that you got to be careful with. And what I mean by loaded, I don't mean somebody's trying to trap you or anything. I just mean you need to be alert for this. And I was reminded of it today uh, in our staff meeting this morning, and then also on the radio program today, I was reminded of this. And that is, what will you do if something happens in the future? What will you do if? Uh, That's a loaded question. Because you may know, you may think you know what you're going to do if, But the answer to that question is, I don't know. The Bible tells me not to worry about tomorrow. And and like I like, like I would offer to you to consider uh, and and think it through, maybe pray it through for your answer. I also will tell people, I don't deal in hypothetical situations. I don't know. I believe the Lord will give me wisdom. If that that happens, I think God will give me wisdom when it happens. But until then, sufficient is the day. I got enough to be concerned with right now of making decisions right in front of me that whatever happens a week from now or three weeks from now, I don't deal in hypotheticals because it's a trap. Because the hypothetical almost always is is designed to undermine your decision today. The hypothetical is almost always designed to undermine your solid decision today. 
And so I don't know. I don't, well, what's going to happen next week? I really don't know. Well, Ed, you know, what kind of answer is that? It's the answer of faith. I'm going to trust God today. And if he gives me next week, I've learned in the past that even in the most crisis situations, God can give wisdom if I'll listen to him. I've also learned in the most crisis situations, I can make mistakes too. But either way, whether I make a mistake or I trust in the Lord by faith, he remains faithful. And so I just want to deal with what's today and what's in front of us. So notice with me God's, uh, what, what God has given to us in his fervent love. Look at verse 22. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth, through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Love one another fervently. This is a command. In the midst of trial, in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of oppression, in the midst of, of just all, all hell breaking loose in a life, what's needed is fervent love for one another. That's what's needed. Can, can I show you what's not needed? Would you go over to Galatians with me in chapter 6? Would you just turn your Bibles? I want you to see this. I want you to compare. I'll tell you what's not needed in a time like this, in a time of difficulty, in a time of challenges, in a time of, you know, chapter five is where I want you to go. Galatians chapter five. What's needed is fervent love. Here's what's not needed. In verse 15. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. It's a powerful statement, but it's even more powerful when it's given to believers. I mean, think about it. Followers of Jesus Christ, born again men and women, biting and devouring one another, destroying one another. No, what's needed is fervent love. This word, if you like to write in your Bibles, you can circle it. It literally means passionate, continual, or intense. It speaks of a growing love. It, it speaks of a love that is on fire, if you will, hot-hearted, passionate. James, he uses the word in James chapter 5, verse 16, he uses the same word in prayer. So have fervent prayer. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Have, have passionate prayer. Have passionate love. It's a great word that describes many things in the Bible. It's used in Luke 22, talking about a fervent desire. Luke 22, 15. Paul uses it when it relationship to serving in Romans chapter 12. In verse 11, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. And now Peter uses it in relationship to love. And you can see how it flows throughout the chapter. You've been saved. You've been loved by God. We've been given new life from God, a new direction, new purpose, new identity. And now God says, let love flow through you to the rest of your family of faith. Passionately continue. This, this is where it happens. Among us is where we practice. This is just practice. Practice on people that share the same core values. Practice on people that have the same spiritual life. Practice on those of us that care about God. So that why? That love spills over into a world that doesn't care about God, that doesn't share our core values, that doesn't, doesn't know how to handle trials, doesn't know how to handle difficulties. When all their hope is in this world, when this world starts caving in, people freak out. They just freak out. Oh, the world's going to end. The world's going to end. It is going to end, but according to the way God said. So get ready for the end. That's the message of the gospel. Get ready for the end. You're right. Things are going to go, they're going to get far worse than this. Well, what are we supposed to do? Be ready for the end. And what do we do while we wait? Fervent love for one another. Fervent love. Passionate. On fire. Let, God love, get, let God's love flow through you. Paul actually, or excuse me, Peter actually uses two different words for love here. The first one is actually the Greek word Philadelphia. Uh, it's from where we get our, we, we know it comes from the root phileo, but that's actually the word he uses. It means brotherly love. It means a family type of love. It, it is a, a very strong word that speaks of that tight knit connection that we have together. 
The second word he uses is the word that describes the love that comes from God, agapeo. But what's interesting to me is that this reminded me, as I was reviewing my notes, it reminded me of that incident. Turn back to John chapter 21 with me. It reminded me of that incident that Peter had with Jesus after the resurrection, where these same two words are used in the dialogue between Jesus and Peter. Notice in John chapter 21, as Jesus is speaking to Peter, kind of re-enlisting him in the ministry, reassessing from his perspective where he is and where he needs to be. Pick up with me in John 21, verse 15. John 21, verse 15. When they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? The word there is agape. Do you agapeo me? Do you, do you love me with that sacrificial love of God? Have you learned yet? Peter's answer was, Lord, you know that I love you. Now, you don't see this in the English, but in the Greek, this is the Greek word phileo. Jesus says, do you love me with that self-sacrificial, surrendered life yet, Peter? And Peter says, Jesus, you know I love you as a brother. You know I love you as a friend. You know I love you in a family way. And Jesus just said, okay then, feed my lambs. And then the next question, verse 16, he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you agape or agapeo me? Do you love me with that supreme God's sacrificial love? And Peter once again answers, yes, Lord, you know I phileo you. You know I love you as a brother. Come on now. Why are you asking me this? You know that's where I'm at. And he says, okay. He answers him, tend my sheep. And then he said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you phileo me? Do you phileo me? And Peter was grieved because he said this, and he says, you know I do. I've said it to you. I think Peter remembered that moment, and he uses the same words here as he describes. He says, look, it's both. It's not one or the other. It's both. Jesus never corrected him, never said, don't you understand? Don't you, are you, do you not hear me? Do you not hear the word I just used? Do you not know the Greek yet, Peter, of all? Don't you understand? He doesn't correct him. He says, okay, I'll meet you where you're at. I love that about Jesus. There's two things I learn about Jesus in his relationship to Peter. Number one, he meets him where he's at. And number two, he's always willing to take you to a higher level. I mean, if you're just in that realm of family love right now, and maybe even just learning what family love is, and and that's just all you can do right now, Jesus says, okay, then get busy doing what I called you to do. And, And you might be there again a year later, and he says, okay, Okay. And then finally, he just says, that's where you're at. That's where I'll meet you. I'll meet you right where you are. Just come and follow me. Do what I've asked you to do. And I love too how it's tied together with action. Fervent love is measured in action. It is for Peter. Peter could measure. And I think that's sort of as you tie it together where his letters was one of the ways that he fulfilled this encounter. He is tending and feeding the lambs. He, is, he not only is tending and feeding the lambs and the sheep of God in that generation, but now 2,000 years later, he's doing the same thing. He put it in writing so that it would continue to be a gift to his church until Jesus returns. I doubt that he even knew he was reading, writing the Bible, that he was being used by God to write the Bible, but there he is teaching us about how important it is for us to have family love here today. Family love. Not biting and devouring one another. Not talking about one another. Not talking behind one another's back. Not trying to destroy a brother or sister. Not trying to take away. I I mean, one of the most challenging passages in all the Bible for me as a pastor is when Paul writes to the Philippians about those people that were preaching the gospel to add affliction to his chains. Remember that? How is that even possible? How can you preach the gospel with the motive to hurt someone else? To make their prison experience? How can you in your mind, out of your mouth, share the good news of the forgiveness of God and the blood that was shed on Calvary? How is it possible that you could have that in your heart and at the same time want to destroy another brother? 
But it's possible. It happened to Paul. It may have happened to you. And so what did Paul say? Some people are preaching the gospel with good motives. Some people are preaching the gospel with bad motives. Well, what are you going to do, Paul? What do you think? You're going to praise the ones with good motives and put... And he says, oh, whatever way, as long as the gospel is being preached. And so our motive and our hearts are to, hey, I'm not going to bite and devour. I want to learn how to love you. I want to learn how to love you as a brother. And when necessary, I need to learn how to lean on the Lord for a love that can only come from God for you. I'm going to learn what Peter would say later on, that love covers a multitude of sins. And I'm just going to expect that there's going to be failure in this room. There's going to be failure among us. That, that we are going to let one another down. Oh, not with ill motives. I mean, trying to do the best. We're just going to make bad decisions. So we're human. We're we still have this issue of battling in the flesh, the spirit and the uh, spirit, lust against the flesh, the two are contrary, so you don't do what you wish. But I want to learn how to love you as a brother, as a sister, and I want to learn how to love you when necessary with the agape love of God, the self-sacrificial love. And I think we do enjoy both here in the, life, in the time that I've been here in this particular church. When you love the Lord and you know how much he loves you, then you naturally love each other. And we're all at different stages of that. We're all learning what that looks like in our lives. We have a love in our church that, that laughs with those who laugh. We have a love that cries with those who cry. We have a love among us that serves and gives and sacrifices. We have a love among us that thinks of others more highly than ourselves. We have a love that helps when the help is needed. Because we live in a world filled with needs. And time and time again, the life of this church has filled needs, both known and unknown. We, we prefer, as a fellowship family, not to mention every single thing that people do in this church. Why? So that people don't get all the attention of the love flowing through this church. It would be very easy for me to print out emails throughout the week I know sometimes attention comes with all the criticism things, but in my email box, the ratio of positive far outweighs the negative. And it would be easy for me to print out four, five, six emails a week and just come up and say, this happened through the church, this happened through the church, and we would rejoice in it. And, and instead, I selectively choose a few from time to time. I mean, I don't even do it on purpose. It's like, man, I just think people need to hear this so that you can be reminded on a global way that there is love flowing through the church. But there is so much happening, known and unknown, that truly God will get the glory. I mean, I think of how you're spread all throughout the community. Not just within the church, but all throughout the community. Now, I mean, you, we, I just found out this morning, the church is in, in the midst of COVID with very few people coming back to church. Like very few, a lot of you are still online for a variety of reasons. Uh, and I know the Holy Spirit will bring you back when needed, but like for a lot, the church has, the, the, the larger global church still hasn't returned, uh, not only here, but many others. With all the COVID, with all of with layoffs, with having now to homeschool your kids when you go in, now you have to, because the schools are closing and then you've got a job and you need daycare and then, and then you get sick and then you're fearful and you have them. Like you think of all the pressure, all the pressures that our church has been under. But when I heard this morning, it was reported of the response that, this, that the church responded, I think near and far, to the, thank, the request for the Thanksgiving meals. It was overwhelming. I mean, I was shocked. I, I didn't know uh, of, of, until this morning just how well the church responded. And the response of the need, you know, the, the request compared to the needs has been lopsided this year. Like we don't have as many people asking for help as much as help has come through. I mean, that, that's fervent love. That's fervent love. Where whatever it might be from a can or a case, a case or you, know, you brought in gift cards, whatever it might be, you, you might think, well, you know, it's just because you asked. No, it's because you answered the call the Lord asked you. You answered the call of the resources he entrusted to you. You were reminded of God's blessing in your life. 
and you responded to it. I, I'm in ministry today because I responded to one of those calls, just one of those invitations in the bulletin. I just responded to it because I felt like the Lord wanted me to do it. And, and little did I know that it would put me on a pathway of what God had in store. I would have no idea. And I, just to think of your response and the over, it's just, we haven't done a lot this year. And what we've done, it's been behind the scenes. It's been to missionaries and we've done, but it's, it's like overwhelming. So whether it's something like that or some of you that have taken the, the role to coach a hockey team or to coach a softball team or to be there for your kids at their game, I mean, you help out with little emergencies. You help out with cleaning things up. And, and just the rise of people to clean, we have more needs for cleaning than ever before. And then we've had some challenges with those that haven't come in to clean and haven't, and then just people showing up to clean. Thank you. Thank you for showing up to clean because you're making it much more safer for the people that want to worship in person. But you're doing it as unto the Lord. And that is an act of love. Don't think about fervent love as just going around and hugging everyone real strong. I love you. I love you. I love you. Everything you do, seen or unseen, in the name of the Lord is a fervency of love. And people benefit from your life. When you visit the homeless or you go to someone's house that hasn't been in service for a while, or you go to the hospital when someone's sick, when you cook meals and you deliver groceries, when you help at the crisis pregnancy center, for love flowing, not only among us, but it's preparation for what's, a, what's outside. Some of you are greatly convicted right now because you are examining your life. The Holy Spirit is examining your life right now and you go, well, I just don't see any of that in my life. God is speaking to you to step up into phileo love. He's speaking to you to speak up into that. Man, I'm, gonna, I, I'm just gonna be vulnerable and I'm gonna care about someone. I'm gonna reach out to someone. I'm going to put myself out there for the sake of the gospel. I'm just going to do it. And I'm just going to leave the results to the Lord. I'm going to send that text message. I'm going to write that email. I'm going to make that phone call. I'm going to step out. Some of you, you know, some of you love by your giving. When you give your time. I think of you, you guys that are here among us that are on the front lines, medical, in the medical arena or on the, as police officers. And the kind of trauma and difficulty you've been on on the front lines. Like on the front lines. And now with numbers spiking again, your workload. I was talking to a sister earlier. Now, you know, in her job, she's working overtime because people are let go and move on. And it's like, man, you're doing it all in the name of Jesus Christ. Don't forget that. What this world needs is to see fervent love, not fervent complaining, fervent love, not, not fervent anger, not fervent frustrations. They need to see and to feel and to experience the love of God through your time, your expertise, your talents, your money, your resources, more importantly, through your hearts and lives. Jesus didn't say that the world would know we're his followers because we meet in a building. He didn't say that the world would know where his followers because of your great preaching and teaching. Your great theology. How you can argue with people and knock them down because you're so smart with the Bible. No. In John 13, 35, this is the mark of true discipleship. That there would be a recognition of the world, the world, the unbelievers. People that hate God, don't want anything to do with God, make decisions all day, every day against God. Those people would know that we're followers of Jesus Christ because of our love for one another. That's how important it is. That's the teaching of Jesus. Love is so important. Fervent love among us is so vital that it is the witness that marks us in our relationship to him, love God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and love our neighbors, ourselves. That's how serious it is. We are the family of God. It starts with phileo, it grows into agape. You know, I think of agape love at times where, you know, agape love is required when we are unable to love. It's required when we're unable to care, where we yield and surrender ourselves to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And we remember we're a family and families work through things. Families fight for unity. Families stick together, especially when times get tough. And you know, it's a neat thing to gather together, and that's what we are committed to doing. 
This room is truly, truly empty during the week, except maybe when the kids are in here for PE. It's truly empty. It's just a shell of a building. And when the kids, the academy kids are gone, then really with just us as the staff, the whole building is so quiet. It's so empty. But when the kids, like today I was down there for, the, for lunchtime and the kids are all walking around, even though you hear a lot of shh, you also hear a lot of happy kids around the property. The body of Christ is here. Even though they're about half size, they're here full size. They love the Lord. And they love being here. And the room comes alive. This room comes alive when the church arrives. There's, a, there's life when we have our staff meeting up here. And that's where we have our staff and our team meetings now up here so we can socially distance and do it right. We have them right up here. And the, life come, the room comes alive. The lights come on. There's prayer in this room. We're talking about the things of God. We're having devos. But it's just a room. You see, I, I know we're in a unique time right now. We're in a unique time where there is that need for many to stay on, to, to be home and stay online because of the crisis and the virus and that. But there are many people, many of you online or listening on the radio that you do not belong at home. You need to get back out and exercise love and come back to the body of Christ. You're not just coming here for you. You're coming here for someone else. You don't just walk in, what do you have for me, Lord? What do you have for me, Lord? What do you have for me? We walk into the gathering. I mean, we start thinking about coming to church. We go, Lord, what do you have for me so I can give it away? That's what you needed in trials. That's the whole thing. What you have need for coming back to Peter is fervent love. You, you've had your souls purified. You are obeying the truth. There's a sincere love of the brethren. So love one another fervently. Increase it increase it. What happens when nobody shows up to church, to the gathering, if you want to call it that, nobody shows up. Nobody's here to serve. Nobody's here to love. Maybe you're even here physically, but everyone else is doing the serving and the loving. You know, maybe it's just time to jump in. And the greatest time to do it is in the midst of the greatest trial that we probably experienced together as a church ever. Now it's time to do it. It's not time to back off. It's not time to put it in reverse. It's time to press in. The harvest is truly plentiful. Get our minds off ourselves and live in that word that the Lord gave us uh, months ago to live with preference, just to put other people before ourselves. Of course, we used it in some of the guidelines and stuff, but it's bigger than that. The little guidelines and things are just training. God's just preparing us for what's up ahead. He's just training us right now for what's next and what's next until the Lord returns. He's just helping us train the next generation as they watch us, our kids and grandkids. He's just helping us display or not, uh, by our choice, the love of God to a broken world. As you get your mind off of yourself and get your mind back on the Lord... It's both rewarding now with promises of rewards in eternity. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 23, it says, And whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you'll receive the reward of the inheritance because you serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything you do, you're serving the Lord. Everything you do, you're not serving man. You're not serving your boss. You're not serving the government. You're not serving your pastor. You're not serving your supervisor. The Bible says, as you do everything heartily, you do it as unto the Lord, knowing that from the Lord you'll receive the reward. And you can't miss this phrase, for you serve the Lord Jesus Christ. He's your Lord. So that means whatever is required of us, we go above and beyond that. Because Jesus deserves above and beyond. He deserves our best because he gave his best. He deserves what we have and more. And if we make it just about the person and the people, then we've missed the point. God is desiring you to step in so that you can practice this fervent love. Not a manufactured or a phony or a syrupy fake love. 
It comes through your life notice of the Holy Spirit in verse 22. The presence of the Spirit. It's sincere, without fakery. That's what he says. Sincere love, without fakery. The art of purity. A concern that's birthed by the Holy Spirit. I know a lot of people use this phrase in the church today, looking for the spirit-filled Christian. And they're always looking for the spirit-filled Christian by some manifestation. And some churches even teach today falsely that the evidence of the Holy Spirit in your life is that you must speak in tongues. No. No, that's neither biblical nor true. The greatest evidence to look for in your life that you've been touched by the Holy Spirit is love. (laughs) The fruit of the Spirit is love. The mark of Jesus Christ upon our lives is love. And if God has given you the gift of tongues, praise, praise God, but didn't he, didn't even Paul say that if you have the gift of tongues, but you have not love, you speak like angels, you got a heavenly language, but you have not love, you're like a clanging brass cymbal. And that'll remind you, you know, when you, when we have a time of worship and you have a brother or sister up playing the drums, that they know how to play the drums. That's a blessing to the church, you know, because somebody could get up there and play them really bad and they could be a distraction and they take your mind off of the song and put it on. Oh my gosh, what is going on? Why are they like, no, but somebody that's skilled, that's why we have skilled men and women on the stage that God is gifted spiritually so that they can just take you with their gifted and in unity and harmony together and just take us right into the heavenly realm with the songs that we sing. So you can have some of the greatest gifts, but if you don't have love, what profit is it? The evidence of God's spirit in you is love. And as we'll see in the following verses in our next study together, what this world needs is it needs fervent love and God's faithful word. And we'll get into that next time. So Father, we are grateful for the love that you've shown us. You've loved us fervently, passionately. And and I love how you use that word passion and not in a sexual way. It's not used like that. The world uses it in a sexual way. But you don't. You use it in a family way. A phileo love. An agapeo love. You you use it in a way that passion that flows from you that is received as you've delivered us. And we are now born again of the Spirit. And I pray for more fervent love among us, especially in the midst of trials and difficulties. Especially in the midst of what we are currently facing right now. We need love, the lubricant that helps when there's so much friction among us. And just forgive us for the friction. Forgive us for, you know, whether it's seen or unseen, whether it's known or unknown, God, just, God, bring us back to a place of fervent love for one another. As we have failed in many ways, to demonstrate your love to a lost and dying world. And we just pray for your help. Because apart from you, we're unable to do that. We can't manufacture it. We can't make it up. We can only lean on you, Lord. So, Lord, I just pray for a fresh outpouring of your Holy Spirit among us. I pray, God, that you would have your way with us, Lord, and minister love and patience and kindness and gentleness. That we would just think of others more highly than ourselves in every way. Forgive us for being so myopic and just seeing just such few things. Forgive us for allowing circumstances to rob us of our peace or our joy. Would you enable us tonight, get our eyes back on you, worshiping you and loving you, serving you. Thank you, God, for the outpouring of the giving of tithes and offerings in our church, the giving of food, the giving of time, the giving of prayer, the giving of the talents and the expertise that's in this room, that's in our church family. And I just pray, God, that you would bring the church back. Give them courage and boldness. I pray for all the things that are swirling in our culture surrounding this virus, that it would come to an end, God, that lives would be spared in every way. I pray for the brother in... um, 
the pastor, a friend of mine I've known for 30, almost 30 years in California right now, Lord, that's in a coma and they don't think he's going to come out because of COVID. And I understand, Lord, the percentages are low compared to other diseases and such, but this guy's a, a faithful servant and he's an important, he's not a percentage, he's a person. So I pray for his new wife. I pray for his pastor and the men that serve alongside of him. I know it's just totally wreck them. Totally hurt them all and, and just cause their hearts to sink. And I just pray, God, that you would do something miraculously and, and that whoever has decision over his life would wait for him. I pray that into their lives tonight, that they would wait. They, that you would infuse his wife right now with a sense of patience. And that as we pray for him, Lord, that maybe even tonight there'd be some sign of progress, something different, something that turns around, Lord. And so let us see people, God, not numbers. Let us remember the people that we serve, not percentages. And let fervent love flow through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand together.